grace and peace to you on this day as we gather for worship. We welcome you, whether you are sitting here in our pews or if you are joining us online, we trust that you will receive a warm Montview welcome. And we also want to welcome this morning Dr. Pete Hulak, who is no stranger to us. He is our minister of visitation and will be preaching for us today. Many of us have received his care, and we look forward to the gifts that he has to offer this morning. As we ground ourselves in this space, take a moment to breathe in God's love, and as you breathe out, to fill God's love filling this space. Will you please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship? We gather to worship the God who crafted the whole of creation. We gather to worship the God who bids us to build a healthy global home filled with justice and compassion. The Psalms, the Psalms declare that it is God who created us, it is God who loves us, it is God who redeems us, and it is God who knows us completely. Before a word is even spoken from our tongues, God knows our hearts. So be assured that there is nowhere that we can go that is separated from the presence of God. As we come to our time of confession, trust that God already knows our hearts, loves us, and forgives us. 
Let us join together in the prayer of confession. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our failure to be what you created us to be. You alone know how often we wander from your ways, waste your gifts, and squander your love. By your grace, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways. For the sake of Christ Jesus, amen. When we face God and ourselves with the awareness of our need, God gives us the grace to grow and the courage to continue on our journey. So let our confession, our letting go, be a blessing and be a gift. May the peace that passes all understanding dwell in our hearts today. Let us pass this peace freely to all who surround you. The peace of Christ be with you. to you all, and good morning to our friends coming up the aisle. Good morning also to our friends here in the sanctuary and everyone joining us online today. So summer is a time when people often take trips. They travel to different places. Have any of you gone on a trip recently? Um, Texas to here. That's a long trip. Have you gone on a trip close by, maybe, to a place in Denver? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I wonder, did you go in a car? Yeah. Have, you, have you gone on a, a trip in a plane? Not this trip. Well, have you ever walked a long, long ways to a new city? No, probably not. Have you ever ridden a horse? <laughs> Maybe not on a long, long trip. Well, long, long ago, people walked or rode horses or donkeys from one place to another. Have you noticed that when we go on a trip, we learn things? We might learn more about people, how they're different in many ways and alike in many ways. Have you noticed that? Yes, all the generations travel, babies and children and parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, and we always have an opportunity to learn more about people. So I want to tell you a Bible story. It's about a man who was taking a trip. 
His name was Saul of Tarsus, and he was probably walking. Some artists show him riding a horse, and he was going to a town called Damascus. But Saul did not believe in the way of God. He didn't believe in the way of love, and he didn't like people who believed in that way. He didn't like people who believed in the lessons that Jesus taught about loving one another. In fact, he was really mean to them, and he was actually going to Damascus to arrest some of the early Christians. And then this happened. He was surrounded by a bright, bright light. It was so bright that he couldn't see. It made him blind, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Then the voice told him to go on to Damascus, and there he would learn and he would change. We're going to talk about the rest of that story next time we're together, but let's pray together now about living in God's way. We fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads, and we all say amen together at the end. Here we go. Dearest God, we thank you for our days, for our opportunities to go new places, opportunities to learn and to change. Be with us in the days ahead that we might live in love, kindness, and generosity. We pray in the name of Jesus, your Son, and we all say together, Amen. Thank you for coming up. It's so good to see you. Have a great time in Colorado.
Let's pray together the prayer for illumination printed in your bulletin. May tongues of fire settle upon us, waking us to your living word. Amen. This morning we have two scripture readings. The first is Psalm 90, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 17, which you can find in your pew Bible on page 510. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. The second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19, which is on, in your pew Bible in the New Testament on page 10. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Listen for the voice of the Spirit speaking to the church. Thanks be to God. Our lessons today are about time, especially that grand arc of history and about how we and all God's generations aspire to live faithfully and to live hopefully, making history together. Barbara and I are co-preaching this morning. May we join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, our help and our hope, inspire our hearts and our hands to express words and sounds which are faithful in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You might wonder about what credentials Barbara and I bring to this sermon about time and about hope. To address time for a moment, you might, you might ask, what could we expect from a music major and a math major? And I suppose we might respond that both sets of our professors, hers and mine, taught us to count. <laughs> Better yet, Barbara can still do it. She learned those easy time signatures as a kid. Three, four, and four, four time, and then eventually seven, eight, and even a piece in 24, 16 time. Nowadays, time signatures are even more complicated. Barbara's inner chronos rooted metronome still reliably qu clicks away. 
In our gospel lesson for this morning, we hear Jesus' words about that generation in which he lived and ministered. He found those people troublesome, even whiny. Jesus identified a diagnosis for the people of his day, and we assert that human nature hasn't changed much in 20 centuries. In so many ways, we are still broken. We are not the first generation to face challenges, to have the need for hope to move us forward. Barbara and I propose that Psalm 90 helps us establish a pathway into wholeness. You might have noticed the words from the psalmist saying, turn back, and at the same time urging, move ahead. We all know that psalm pretty well, thanks to people who have read it to us over the years. Thank you, Ben. We might know the psalm even better because of the work of Isaac Watts, the hymn writer who about 300 years ago rearranged the text into meter and rhyme, creating our hymn, our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. About 200 years ago, this hymn was coupled with the tune now known as St. Anne. Just to get us all together in heart, Barbara will play a stanza for us. Please stay seated. Now, we named this sermon Ages Past and Years to Come. Another title, perhaps even more faithful to Isaac Watts, might be Our God, Our Help, and Our O oh God, Our Hope, especially since this morning's words are focused on helping us redefine and reclaim the word hope. We return for a moment to the concept of time. It seems so straightforward. Ancient scientists loved to measure it. By about 3000 BCE, Chinese philosophers and astronomers had invented sundials and water clocks. Not too much later, Egyptian and others in the Middle East fell right in step with the same inventions. And centuries later, the pendulum clock was invented on Christmas Day, 1656, by Dutch scientist and inventor Christian Huygens. And now, cesium atom clocks are the most precise of all. In another 1.4 million years, all the cesium clocks in use today will vary from each other by no more than one second. With accuracy like that, do we need more? Is there any need to go deeper into time? A friend of mine named Luke reminded me a few days ago that Plato also understood that time is a lot more than just the passage of seconds and seasons, of brief moments and long generations. And the writer of Ecclesiastes wrote about a time for this and a time for that. Pete Seeger, in our era, used those words to create his 1965 song, Turn, Turn, Turn. There is an interesting human nature fact here. We all have noted that time not only marches on, there are also times when time rushes or creeps. Time is occasionally a very elastic metric. Many of us who have been parents remember car trips when those voices from the back seat asked, Mom, are we there yet? 
the, the adults in the car, the ones whose inner clocks are moving at a different speed, are sometimes just plain annoyed. As time moves along, other things happen too. In the 1930s, men's neckties were about four inches wide. In the 60s and 70s, the average width was between one and one and a half inches. And back in 1971, when we first became Montview members, the word avocado usually meant the color of new refrigerator doors. <laughs> Times have changed. Now, avocado is some kind of green, squishy food thing you mash and spread on your toast. Time and fashion move along and sometimes cycle in and out. Psalm 90 is helpful here. Many Bibles attribute it to Moses. If that were literally true, it would make it the oldest of the 150 Psalms. Many scholars, though, including Dr. Walter Brueggemann, our friend, dates it back to the beginning, uh, to the end of the exile in Babylon about two and a half millennia ago. The Jewish people freed from one kind of captivity were heading back to their ruined hometown, Jerusalem. The psalmists of the Babylonian era most likely remembered Moses, who had centuries earlier also led the people away from captivity and into a new challenge. God's people looked back in history to slavery and captivity and looked ahead in time to an immense job of building or rebuilding their city. And they looked at their present lives where they had no dwelling place, just a long road to travel. Where was hope in that picture? The psalmists intended to comfort them and challenge them. As we look back and ahead, this psalm also comforts and challenges us. And it flames the, the it, it, fan, it fans the flames of hope. We all remember our own histories in so many ways. When grounded in faith, we remember history for what it has taught us. <clears throat> we might think about the present with pain or with joy. When we are fortunate, we think about the present with gratitude. Oh yes, and then that future. Contemplating the future often takes us right to fear. Better than that route though, <clears throat> we think about what is, what is to come and how it might stir up in us a new kind of life in hope. Hope is a word which has taken on all sorts of meanings these days. It is spoken so frequently that its power has been diluted. The news anchors on one of the local channels recently on one 20-minute news segment applied the word hope seven different times. Their contexts were things like this. We hope the hail won't hit us. <clears throat> and hopefully the Rockies will finally get out of the cellar. The psalmist, while honoring the deep yearnings of our hearts, was talking about something different. Maybe we could coin a word to describe that shallower expression of hope. You might remember that the Merriam-Webster word of the year in 2006 was truthiness. It was coined by Stephen Colbert intending to describe that expression of hope as something which sounds, which sounds like the truth, but really isn't. In that same mode, perhaps you'd let us invent a term, hopiness. <laughs> hopiness is that state of really wanting something, expecting that our inner powers, if they work hard enough, will make it happen. Another word for it might be Santa Claus hope. Hopiness <laughs> is a fearful of reality, but hope, grounded in faith, 
welcomes real truth and digs into it. Real hope is real. Real hope is a sacred force which pulls us forward into tomorrow. In doing that, it also changes the way we live today. One of Barber's church music publications recorded this story a few years ago. After a particular Sunday service, not in this sanctuary, an angry parishioner confronted the pastor with these words. Reverend, that new hymn you had us sing was terrible. Don't you know there are already plenty of fine hymns in our hymnal? Who needs new ones? They do not need to be replaced. Hmm. That conversation happened in about 1870. The historical record of it does not include any account of how the pastor cared for that parishioner or did any self-care, but we do know that the offending hymn was, what a friend we have in Jesus. In our time, that hymn is considered an old chestnut. Yes, time moves on. The poor parishioner was living in fear a fear which made him try to grab on tightly to the old ways. And here is another story from a musical journal. It happened in the first couple of decades of the century. The nation's music conservatories got together and decided there was no longer any need to build organs or to teach organists. Churches, after all, had just plain quit having organ music. That's life out there these days, isn't it? Now, now, I did withhold a couple of critical facts in telling you that story. Those decades were the first two decades of the 19th century. And the nation was France. Now, something important happened two generations after the predicted death of French organ music. In, sp <laughs> in spite of the conservatory's decisions back then, time moved along into an amazing renaissance of French church musicians, many of them with renown far outliving their own lives. People like Vidor, do you know that, Toccata? And so many others. So the slump in serious music was only a hibernation. The new music was vital and strong, and it was dramatically different from the music of those earlier decades. The French conservatory directors ended up being wrong. They did not have a big enough sense of past history or the sense that God is our refuge in all generations. Many religious leaders these days bemoan the drop in church attendance, the loss of church choirs, and, and, and yes, organ music, at, at least in some places. And they, they moan, bemoan the ascendancy of informal combos in worship. It wasn't like this back in 1954, they say. Oh, and classical music is on the decline. This generation has given up on structure. Barb and I will counter that thought with this memory. When we came to Denver in 1971, the city had only one choral music group. Recently, our friend, Dr. Mary Louise Burke, 
spoke with some of her musical peers in Denver. They estimate that there are now about 40 fine choral groups. You might add a thought that, well, the singers are probably really old, and the reality is that there are very, very many young singers. So this is not an appeal to, f to forget our thoughts about the future. This is an appeal to humility, an appeal to say that we don't know it all, an appeal to us to say that God inspires our imaginations. God helps us when things change, and God helps things change. Here's one more context going back to Isaac Watts. He was English and of a congregational denomination called the dissenters. The established church worked against them. Watts knew how fearful his friends were. His poetry, rooted in the Psalms, was intended to move them from a sense of powerlessness to an understanding that their current miseries were like those of their ancestors of centuries earlier. Watts wanted them to move from fear to hope. We nowadays think of our God, our help in ages past as a grand expression of the glories of Christendom. For Isaac Watts, though, our God, our help in ages past was more rugged, an appeal to God for comfort in a great challenge, something perhaps akin to we shall overcome. Who gets the final word in this sermon? We all do. Let us stand and sing together the congregational anthem, hymn number 687.
Please be seated. If you are visiting with us for the first time here at Mahview, uh, we hope you feel warmly, warmly welcomed here. If you're watching for the first time, welcome to you as well. If you are here in the sanctuary, I invite you to take the uh, friendship pad on the inside of the aisle and let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning. Our ministry highlight this morning is uh, a nonprofit called the Seeds of South Sudan. And this is an organization that we have been involved with for many years. Uh, thanks largely to uh, a couple of Montview members, John and Peggy Gonder, and the founder of Seeds of South Sudan, Arak Garang. Arak is one of the uh, lost boys of South Sudan. You may have, there's, there's a movie about them, there's books about them, and Arak was one of those lost boys, orphaned in South Sudan, and spent 10 years in a refugee camp uh, in Kenya. And then he came to the United States, got his college degree, and then he started this nonprofit to help other orphaned refugees get an education at boarding schools in Kenya. It is a remarkable story. And we are fortunate today that Iraq is here this morning and right after church today, if you've got a little extra time and would like to learn more about this, um, he's giving a talk in the Miller Center. So it's right after church today, you can learn how to uh, be supportive of that organization. And just in general, for all of the uh, wonderful ministries, your, uh, our thanks to your, uh, for your generosity in supporting all of these ministries like S Seeds of South Sudan, um, the impact that we have together when we share our resources is remarkable. And we have changed lives, I know, and Iraq would, would be very grateful for the support of this church and what we've done with that organization and so many others. Um, so, this is why we pause at every church service and we stand as we are able and we pray a prayer of dedication to give thanks for these gifts. So if you will stand now, let us pray together. God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves our wills and our works, a continual thank offering to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. be seated. Let us continue in prayer. Holy God, we breathe in slowly, aware of the miracle of being alive. We breathe out slowly, releasing our worry and what burdens us, inhaling we feel alive, exhaling, we feel held, inhaling, exhaling. Life is ever before us, changing and moving, rising and falling like our breath. Help us, O oh God, to be more attentive, more attuned to the unfolding rhythms of life around us. Help us to be more trusting that we have enough 
that we have what we need and that life is good. Help us to trust that life has purpose and meaning even when it's hard and that you, the creator of all that we see, in wisdom and in love, hold your creation faithfully. We pray for those in our lives who are struggling, those who feel lonely or sad or unwell. May they feel our love for them and know that they are not alone. And we pray for our world that we will choose compassionate paths of governance that make space for all of your children to be as they were born to be. May those who suffer find an inner strength and a safety in your love. And may those who create suffering for others find their hearts softened as they learn to live the path of love. And may each of us who both suffer and create suffering, learn the way of Jesus, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. And may that yoke transform us just a little more each day as we grow to live in the light and the freedom and the grace of Jesus' love. For all of our many gifts, we give thanks, and we surrender control of our lives again to your faithful care. In the love of Christ Jesus, we pray, and in his way, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's stand in body or spirit for our closing hymn.
we leave you with a charge. Almost 50 years ago, this congregation's retired pastor, Dr. Arthur Miller, stood in that pulpit and preached a sermon recognizing that he was advancing in years. And his sermon title was Life's Precious Jeopardy. He intended it not only to inspire people advancing in years, to, but to inspire each of us to say, we don't know what the future brings, but we do know that in life, God is with us. We go forth knowing that the power of our creator and of our redeemer and our sustainer never leaves us. Thanks be to God.
Hello, I'm Rebecca Koenigberg. I'm a professor in the music department at Metropolitan State University and a member at Montview Presbyterian Church. Hi, I'm Sandy Prouty. I'm the Minister of Children and Families at Montview and an art teacher. We lead Summer Sacred Art. Give us another chance. We use songs with motion, objects, art making, stories, dance, and practices to explore world religions. We learn, celebrate, and honor four faith traditions each week. Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, and Hinduism. On Fridays, we focus on peace and getting along with others. We use the golden rule, which is part of every major world religion. We have so much fun. And we make and strengthen friendships. Come join us this summer. summer.